Hey, Pittsburgh, are you looking to party? If you want to cheers with us here at CityCast Pittsburgh in real life, we're joining our friends at the Pittsburgh Independent for their print issue launch party. It's this Sunday from 6 to 9 p.m. at Bottle Rocket Social Hall in Allentown. It costs just $10 to enter and you'll get a CityCast sticker plus two free copies of the newspaper. And if you have anything fun to say, you might just hear yourself on a future episode of the CityCast Pittsburgh podcast. Hope we see you in there. Today on CityCast Pittsburgh, a local program for movie and theater professionals is getting a reboot. We found another thing the state is the worst at, and there's a new proposal to study something that the whole city has already agreed needs to happen. It's June 9th, the Friday News Roundup. I'm Megan Harris, and here's what Pittsburgh's talking about. I'm with CityCast producers Maria Carter and Mallory Falk. I'm cubed today. Uh, (laughs) How have y'all been doing with the wildfire smoke this week? Okay, myself, um, more just a sad how, I mean, hazy it is outside, except beautiful moon and sunsets That's because of saying. it. It's really unfortunate around here that the best sunsets are usually the worst air quality days. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Mallory? Yeah, I mean, I've just been, you know, trying to stay indoors and, and enjoy these beautiful sunsets from afar. I know, windows closed and I still have a scratchy throat. Here we are. Um, let's jump into our stories today. Uh, the first one is a new proposal. City Council gave preliminary approval for a $2.2 million study to replace our streetlights. Have y'all been following this? It's been happening for years. A little bit. Yeah. I have not. And I guess I'm curious how many streetlights you could replace with the $2.2 million that's instead going into a study about them. Yeah, right. Um, I think we have an estimated 40000 I've seen a couple numbers bandied about 35000 40000 I think it depends on maybe how you're counting. Um, and I know they've replaced a few in the past. But yeah, so most of the... St- Street lights in our city are those high pressure sodium vapor lights. So mm-hmm. they look kind of amber colored um, and they want to replace them with more energy efficient LED ones, ideally shielded, low temperature. I think it's a little complicated, but yeah, a bunch of cities have been doing it nationwide. Can't we just track the success of other cities instead of, <laughs> you know, put dumping money into a study here in Pittsburgh. Makes one wonder, right? I think that's why our progress on it has been like super delayed because other cities did jump into it really quickly. It turns out they picked lights that weren't as energy efficient or cost savings like appropriate as they wanted. And that's why city council um, has been sort of dragging its feet, I think. I think that's fair on some of these proposals, but maybe wisely. Um, The company that Pittsburgh is going to work with is called the Efficiency Network. Um, They're Pittsburgh-based and and they're owned by the same company as Duquesne Light. Um, so there's some interesting questions there about how the contracts are going to work. Does Duquesne Light own the streetlights here? Or is it the city that owns those? That's a great question. I actually don't know. We should look into that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, but like the potential cost savings for it, right? Like, does that go to the city? Is it the companies themselves? Like, because one thinks that they're like kind of sharing a pot of money. I'm not sure. So, I mean, why why replace these streetlights that are already working and uh, lighting up the street? (laughs) I think some of it's about money. Uh, Some of it's about that energy output. Um, Probably the lowest priority, but I think still a really important one is just like quality of life. I mean, is that what they're studying? Like if it's going to save money or like what? What's the purpose of the study? I think maybe just to get some more information. So in 2021, I mean, honestly, um, City Council authorized a $16 million investment into this modernization project. Um, that was going to include planning, design, and construction. And they ultimately decided not to move forward with it. Um, the Trib just reported this week that now they're going to break the contract into two parts. So there's going to be the planning phase is going to be one bid, and then the actual implementation will be a second one. And so now they're breaking apart and spending a couple million of that 16 million to see how to best accomplish that. Mm. It all feels very Pennsylvania to me. (laughs) Uh So study, then planning, then actually doing the thing. Maybe. We'll see. (laughs) (laughs) Megan, you mentioned quality of life. How does changing the light bulbs affect quality of life? 
Yeah, so we talked to a dark sky expert here at CityCast about this last year. Um, so, you know, turning off unnecessary light, not shining it all straight up into the sky, um, not using blue light in dark spaces. Um, her name was Diane Turnshek, and I'll let her kind of get into the nitty gritty of light pollution. Basically, just don't waste light. Don't use more than you need. Don't shine light upwards towards the sky because it's not doing anybody any good. All the cities on the East Coast have terrible light pollution. It's the unnecessary, annoying uh, light up in the sky over the city. It causes what we call sky glow, which is the whole city has got a dome of white over it. And it, it makes it so that you can't see the stars. The stars are still there. The Milky Way is still there above your head. You just can't see it. And so people have stopped looking up, stopped even bothering. And that's half the universe. We live in a 3D world, right? And people are just acting like it's a 2D world now. So if we get the study right, we'll be living in a 3D world again? Maybe. I hope so. (laughs) Um, You know, she goes on to talk about, you know, kind of like how it affects our flora and fauna, um, that, you know, having light hit our circadian rhythm the way it does can like actually cause hormonal imbalances in people and animals. It affects our melatonin production. Um, There's some studies now that it could affect diabetes or heart disease or obesity or mood disorders. It's just like a lot of things that we don't think about. Even like fireflies, they mate in darkness. And if there's never darkness in cities, then you lose the ability ability to have like pretty little bugs hanging out in the summertime. Okay, this is actually making me feel antsy to get these lights replaced as soon as possible. I want our lightning bugs to be able to have their romance time. (laughs) (laughs) The sexy time. Exactly. But what would it take to like actually get this done? It seems like a pretty big logistic challenge to replace all of the city's streetlights. Yeah, it's going to be a huge one. It'll definitely take multiple years. Um, and the funding structure for it's a little bit different too. Um, I think right now they have 15 million earmarked for it. Um, some of that's from the American Rescue Plan Act from COVID. Um, and some of it's bond money that comes from the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure. Um, so it's it's going to take some time. And that's after, of course, the study component. Fireflies, lightning bugs, whatever you want to call it, y'all might have to wait a minute to uh, get it on, but there's hope for you yet. Hey, CityCast Pittsburgh, it's Michael Zibiak. While CityCast Pittsburgh works hard every day to connect you with the stories that matter most, I'm working in the background, making sure that our listeners are connecting with the best that Pittsburgh has to offer. So what does that look like? It means meeting with the people who make Pittsburgh what it is. The business owners, the stakeholders, the decision makers, the Pittsburghers who put together those food festivals you enjoy, the concerts you attend, the exhibits you can't miss, and who make those candles your mom can't stop talking about. If this sounds like you, let me help you get your message out to the city's best audience with an ad right here on the CityCast Pittsburgh podcast and on our sister daily newsletter, Hey Pittsburgh. Shoot me an email at ads at citycast.fm and let's connect. The Council of Franks, on behalf of delicious Oscar Mayer 100% beef franks, has declared its official position. Oscar Mayer 100% beef franks are... 100% beef frank delicious. This summer, choose delicious. Choose 100% beef. Keep it Oscar. So from fireflies to another tiny creature. This one's far less pleasant, though. Yeah, we're talking ticks, Megan. (laughs) Yeah, gross, right? Like, have you all had a tick bite? Not that I know of, somehow. And I played what? outside constantly oh as a kid. Oh, my gosh. I, I had garden so a lot. many as a kid. Really? Kid. Yeah. I haven't. But it, what's funny is, you know, when I adopted my dog, I was living in El Paso, Texas. And when we moved here, the vet, one of the first things the vet asked was, like, are you on this? Have you gotten your dog a tick vaccine? And it was just, like, a thing you didn't need to think about in the Southwest. Yeah. Um, because that region hasn't been hit the same way like New England and the East Coast have. And that was a rude awakening into what I had just moved back into. And what I think Mallory's alluding to here is it's not just the ticks that we're worried about, but the diseases that they carry, especially Lyme disease. Yeah. And Pennsylvania has a dubious honor. 
Oh, no. I know. I know. (laughs) It's number one in Lyme disease cases. Wait, nationwide? 11 of the past 12 years, according to the CDC. Wow. I really thought Connecticut was the center point. We got a lot more people. Because Lyme, Connecticut, that's where it was discovered. That's why it's called Lyme disease. Wait. Really? I had yeah. no idea. <laughs> I think some recent research is that maybe it's existed for a long time. It was, you know, uh, yeah, more of course. identified in Connecticut. But yeah, it's uh, just getting worse and worse. There are about 10,000 cases reported in Pennsylvania each year. And that is probably like vastly undercounted. So it could be like as many as one in 100 Pennsylvanians get Lyme disease each year. Oh, yeah. I guess it's like COVID numbers. Like you only yeah. know if somebody reports it into a medical yeah. provider and that makes it to the state. What I don't I feel bad about this. What even is Lyme disease? Like I know there's a fatigue <laughs> element. That's it. Yeah. The other big element you hear about a lot is the bullseye rash, right? It's oh, a, right. after you get the tick bite, then there's like this rash. It kind of looks like a bullseye like around a it. Like a target symbol? Yeah, like a target symbol, but on your skin. Oh. Um, and <laughs> uh, one of the things to note about this, not all cases of Lyme disease have that rash or sometimes it looks different. And especially on the skin of color, it's not going to be red in that same way a lot of times. It might just be darker. And so don't assume just because I didn't have a bullseye rash that you don't have Lyme disease if you're feeling some of the other effects. Yeah. And what are those effects? Yeah. Well, a lot of it is fever, headache, joint stiffness, and it can take up to a month to develop some of those early symptoms. Joint and then, stiffness. That's yeah. like, oh, that, it's yeah. like having the flu. That just sounds yeah. terrible. Yeah. And, and then it can go on from there. And then people have like post-Lyme syndrome as well. And so it can really affect people's lives for not just a few weeks, but the rest of their life sometimes. Is it like a thing you take treatment for and then it's gone or does it stick around? Well, um, you can take treatment for it, uh, which is antibiotics. It's a bacteria. And so, you know, but some people even after being treated still have symptoms. Oh. Do we know why Pennsylvania is number one? Is there like anything unique to the state? Or are just are there a lot of people who want to self report who lived here who live here like are Pennsylvanians more responsible? Yeah, I mean, we also I, have a lot of wooded area and a lot of farmland, mm-hmm. and we're yeah. big. Yeah, we also have a lot of deer. We have mm. a lot of uh, uh, of mice out in the forest. There's a you know sp- it's the white legged mouse, I believe. Wait, what? <laughs> that it is a carrier of the ticks that then carry Lyme disease. It's the country mice's fault. It's the country, yeah. It's the country mouse that you know. <laughs> Is hurt, hurting us city mice over here. Um, but yeah, so, you know, it's partly because these spread. Another thing, climate change could be affecting some of the numbers um, and increasing the likelihood because ticks What don't- isn't climate change destroying? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but so climate change, you know, it, warmer, wetter temperatures are great for ticks. And um, that could just mean more of this in the years to come. So, I mean, I, I when I go outside, I try to make sure, like, if I'm going to be in a wooded area, I have, like, long pants and socks and stuff like that. Is there anything else you can do to try to stay safe or keep away from these things? Yeah, there are some sprays you can spray on yourself. Um, and then, you know, the, the really important part about Lyme disease is really getting any ticks off yourself as soon as possible. You know, it's not just, like, it bites you and then two seconds later you have Lyme disease. It's really trying to get that tick off within the first 36 hours. Oh, Um, that's a much longer runway than I expected. Yeah, I mean, you know, still monitor yourself. Um, I think I was thinking of this like a snake bite, like it's venom (laughs) and it's just like taking over like Spider-Man. No, it's it's slow acting. It can really take up to a month to get some of those symptoms. And so the advice is, you know, if you get a tick bite, remove it with tweezers. And you have to get the head, is that right? Um, ideally, if some of it's left in, you're at risk for infection. Um, but the other big thing is save those ticks if you do get a tick bite and you can send them in for free as a Pennsylvania resident mm. um, to ticklab.org and they will test it for Lyme and a bunch of other tick-borne diseases. And, you know, you can just find out that way. Oh. Yeah. Just a plastic baggie. You don't have to do anything all that special to send it in. Boy, I never would have thought of sending in a bug to a lab, but new learnings all around. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, see your doctor. If you do have a tick that you think has been attached for more than 36 hours, you can get um, antibiotics very early on. This all seems very bleak. Yeah. Are there any signs of hope here? There actually are signs of hope. And I think the one big one is uh, 
a vaccine for humans. Um, currently, there is a canine vaccine, so your dog can be protected, and as you know, Mallory. But yay, zero. For, yeah, yeah. But for me and you, there's a phase three trial in the works. So you know that could be coming in the next few years. A vaccine for Lyme disease. Sorry, it's just <laughs> hilarious to me that I I didn't even question the fact that like we could bring in our dog for a vaccine for this and but I couldn't get one myself. It never occurred to me to wonder why that was. Yeah, there was actually a human vaccine earlier, but it was taken off the market over some safety concerns. I think it was about the time that a lot of people were getting concerned about vaccines and autism. And I I don't know the whole story there, but um, yeah. Mallory and I are heavy sighing over here. (laughs) (laughs) Aren't we all? And the other thing, the people that you send the ticks to, the Pennsylvania Tick Research Lab, is doing all kinds of research and trying to figure out, like, more about ticks and how they migrate and blah, blah, blah. To Sorry, I feel like I'm minimizing their research there. Blah, blah, blah. But, you know, so we can have better... Very important blog. (laughs) So we can have better maps and understandings of, you know, how humans and ticks interact and what can keep us safe. So we've done lights and lime, and now we've got limelight. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, happy to bring it all home. So Pittsburgh, since 2019, has had this program to train folks for kind of behind-the-scenes jobs in the film industry. And that program is expanding now. The Pittsburgh Film Office and Pittsburgh Public Theater uh, just announced that it's teamed up to form something called Create PA, Film and Theater Works, that's going to train even more folks and even more jobs to help propel them into both the film and theater industries here. What kinds of jobs? Yeah, so the current program trains for things like electrical worker, grip, and hairstylist. Mm-hmm. And this is Wait, gonna... what's a grip? They're the people that literally like hold the, the, wow. the microphones okay. above okay. and things like that, or various equipment. I've been a grip before. <laughs> it's one of the few cr- film credits I actually have. Ooh. <laughs> Um, Yeah, so now it'll expand to include jobs like carpenter, set decorator, wardrober, and it's going to have that focus both on film and the theater, which apparently um, I was reading some reporting in WESA that this is kind of unique, like outside of New York, most training programs don't cover both arenas, but that the skills are are really similar for both theater and film. And so this will enable people to go into either industry. The thing that strikes me about these kinds of positions, too, is that like some of them are certification work, but they're not college degree requirement. Like you don't go to school for that in the same way. And also a lot of them or maybe all of them are union jobs, too. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, part of this program is you're paired with a mentor and then you're put on the path to union membership. And so it's really, you know, if you can get into this line of work, it's like a pretty solid and accessible um, line of work to go into for folks here. That's really cool. It kind of feels like some of this is playing into that whole like idea that Pittsburgh could eventually be the Hollywood on the Mon. Have y'all ever heard that, <laughs> that phrase? <laughs> Not without laughing. <laughs> I mean, I understand where it's coming from, right? Like, there are a lot of movies shot here, right? Uh, movies and series, especially yeah. here recently. There's been a lot of fun ones. Yeah. And I don't know, it makes sense to me. Like Pittsburgh is a good place if you're looking for a kind of like industrial collapse, post-apocalyptic landscape. We've got that covered. Mm -hmm. But then we've also got these like beautiful rolling hills and like a whole wide array of places to shoot. Farms, the little row houses, um, tons of old stuff that's just like sort of dilapidated. I think that's why the uh, A League of Their Own decided to shoot the new series here because we still had like baseball fields that looked (laughs) post-war. Good job, Pittsburgh. Yeah. Our decay is finally an asset. <laughs> right. Um, and then Lawrenceville has been a stand-in for Brooklyn, New York a lot. Some of our that hillsides makes sense. have I... been stand-ins for San Francisco. <laughs> like, it's, I don't know, it's kind of neat. And also, people have been incentivized to film here, right? I know, like, you know, in the past, I don't know, however many years, some of these cities like Pittsburgh have established themselves as places to film because of tax credits. Totally. I, I I take this for granted sometimes. Do you all know how tax credits work? The film tax credit, at least? Not the film tax credit. So in Pennsylvania, it's 25% of the cost of your production, um, but it's capped. So if a film or a TV show wants to come here or Philly, they all have to share the same pot of money. Um, and in Pennsylvania, until recently, that was $70 million. You can imagine, given the cost of a lot of films, that ain't that much. No. Um and they just, they've been lobbying for years and they just got it pushed up to a hundred million. It was less than what they were asking for, but it is obviously a little bit better than what we had. 
So that increase is an exciting development for folks in the film industry. But also last fall, I guess, officials broke ground on this new film studio near the Carry Blast Furnaces called the Film Furnace. And it's going to have a couple sound stages, which apparently like that had been a big issue here um, when folks did want to film here was that there weren't these kind of dedicated sound stages they could go to. So it's going to be more one stop shopping here. And we have a couple already, but I think having any amount of like additional influx is also really helpful. Like the last figures I saw was something like 30,000 workers statewide are working in the film business, including like vendors and contractors and everything. Um, So that that one time you held something (laughs) in... That was in a different state, actually. (laughs) Um, A state with a higher film tax credit. There are, I think, 40 states last I looked that have tax credits and Pennsylvania was not uh, definitely middle of the road. Mm. So we're doing well given our film tax credit. But a lot more places like apply to do business here. Yeah. They want to shoot in Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh and Philly and they can't because we like, I mean, if they're going to be able to write off any amount of the production cost, they're going to do that. They're going to pick other yeah. states like Louisiana and Georgia. Yeah, Louisiana is a big one. I remember when I when I was living in New Orleans for a time, I was working downtown and like every time I left the office, it was like, what is the street going to look like today? Is it going to be a civil war scene? Like one time I stepped out and there was dust in wagons and I definitely noticed a lot more filming there than I have in Pittsburgh, even as Pittsburgh is experiencing this like filming boom. And then the other stipulation too for the film tax credit here is that a certain amount of the work has to be done in the state and a certain amount of the workers have to be local. Oh, uh, so this really will help people get that tax credit too. Yeah, ideally. And I think with the increase um, this past year, it also um, sets aside just a small portion of that for Pennsylvania films. So not just outsiders coming here wanting to use our Mm. landscapes or our workers, but people here locally who want to create something from within. So this is my chance to throw my podcasting career to the wind and (laughs) go for Hollywood on the Mon. Yeah, do it. So yeah, this, like I said, this program started in 2019. Now it's expanding. Um, And so right now it's in the stage where they're kind of figuring out what this larger joint project is going to look like and recruiting students. So stay tuned for more about, you know, when applications open up to participate in this training. And we'll put what we do know in our show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. Our music is by Benji. Mallory Falk is our lead producer. Maria Carter helps make the show. And a special shout out this week to the Philly pod team too. Laura Benshoff, Abby Fritz, Elizabeth Kama, we miss you Lizzie, and Trené Nuri. Francesca DeBecco writes our newsletter and I'm your host, Megan Harris. We'll be back on Monday with more news from around the city. Y'all have a good weekend. I would. I'd just like walk out of the office, go to get a coffee and like a wagon would fly by.